Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson. I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones. Today, I would like to tell you about my favorite instrument to use on identifying gemstones, certain gemstones. So I'm going to tell you what it is, how it works, what book can help you get there, and what other things you're going to need to actually practice it and get competent at it. Because while it is my favorite instrument, it is also not easy. It reminds me of that time that I picked up the violin. <laughs> still play though. So let's start at the beginning. What is my favorite instrument? This instrument is called the spectroscope. Spectroscope, spectrum, you might not be surprised that it actually has a rainbow on the inside. But what does the rainbow tell us? Well, one of the most interesting things about gemstones in general is how they interact with light. And if you watched the episode on color, I talked about selective absorption of color. So when white light goes into a gemstone, the gemstone will absorb certain wavelengths of light and reject other wavelengths of light back up to us. All materials that we see in the world do that, but gemstones do it even more and better. Much more better. So when we say that something is blue, the truth is blue is what's being rejected by the stone and the stone is actually something else. So without diving into the metaphysical of how cool that is, what we need to understand to identify different stones is what wavelengths have been absorbed and what wavelengths have been rejected. And sometimes there is a distinctive pattern that's unique to the chemical composition of that stone. That is not true with all stones in a way that we can verify with this instrument, but many stones that I like can be, such as spessartite, jadeite, blue sapphire, rubies, zircons. Lots of stones have spectra. And I understand that this sounds really arcane and academic, so let's break it down a little bit. This instrument, the spectroscope, what it does is it has a diffraction grating in it. And what it basically allows us to do is see the visible spectrum, which is the entire range of the rainbow. At the bottom of them, there are numbers. Those numbers correspond to the wavelength. The visible spectrum has a measurable number for each color inside the visible wavelength, and that corresponds to a length in nanometers. One thing that I find very interesting about color from a scientific point of view is that there are visible colors that have a measurable number, but then some colors that we're capable of seeing don't actually exist because they don't fit on the visible spectrum, but our brain creates them. Purple is one of those things. Violet has a number, red has a number, but purple does not. Our brain creates it. So some gemologists actually like to call it a sensation. Here, I'm getting all worked up about rainbows and stuff. So what I love about this is if you inspect a piece of almondine and you see that spectrum and you look at another stone with a very similar color, but you inspect the spectrum, you're not going to find the same type of spectrum in a different stone with the same kind of color. This is something our eyes are not capable of seeing without this tool. And the tool effectively, as long as it's cared for properly, can last a lifetime, or at least a very long time. And given the price of the thing, if you need to buy another one, buy another one. So when we look into the instrument, sometimes we will see a pattern that relates to what wavelengths are being eaten by that gemstone. This pattern of selective color absorption is what we call the spectrum of the gemstone. And that pattern is unique to that material. And this is where things get quite tricky because you have to memorize the patterns. But it's a lot like remembering how one of your friends walks or dresses. Even if they're in a crowd of people and they're standing hundreds of meters off, as soon as you watch them move, you know that it's your friend right over there. And that's how I feel about spessartite. As I've said many, many times on this channel, one of my favorite gemstones is spessartite. That's one variety of orange garnet. And it's substantially more rare than another variety of brownish, yellowish, orange garnet called hessonite, and those are in two different families. So if I'm going around and I'm wanting to buy spessartite, make sure that it's not hessonite, there is one tool that I need, and it provides incontrovertible truth, which I really like. So spessartite, whether it's this piece on my pendant right here, or on my ring, or the pieces that I have in my collection, you're gonna put a full spectrum light source behind it, and with enough light going through it, then we can put our spectroscope on top of it and see what there is to see. You're going to start out first with the rainbow that we talked about. Many of our spectroscopes do not have numbers across the bottom, so don't worry about that. The idea is paying attention to what color has what absorption patterns. Are they lines or are they bands? Are there several lines? Are there several bands? Where are they? Try and make a note of them as specifically as you can. Are they in the far violet or are they slightly in the blue. The closer you can get to having a number corresponding to the nanometer 
measurements that we see in the book, the better you will be. When I look at a piece of spessartite with a light and the spectroscope, I know that pattern because I've seen it so many times. And I feel the same way about jadeite. I see a very particular pattern that helps me to know this is jadeite. All of the pieces that I've seen worldwide have had that particular pattern. Some gemstones have spectra that are very close to each other, such as, ooh, jadeite and Vesuvianite. That one can trip you up pretty heavily if you're doing your gemological examinations. And yes, they can look very similarly. Now enough blathering. Learning the spectroscope is not the easiest thing in the world. I struggled with it during my education. But I had a friend that had studied in the batch before me and I was like, help me understand this tool. I see the power, but I don't get it. My friend came up to the lab with me, chose out a couple of key stones, which I'll talk about in just a little bit, and helped me to get comfortable with what am I actually looking for here. It's one thing to look at a pretty rainbow, it's another thing to actually gain knowledge from the rainbow, which also sounds esoteric. But one thing that you can do is get yourself a copy of the OPL, A Student's Guide to Spectroscopy, which while that sounds incredibly dry, is actually super interesting. And realistically, it's quite a small book. This has enough of a theoretical foundation for you to understand how the spectroscope works without you getting bogged down in minutia. It also has a variety of spectra in here so that you can compare this with what you're seeing in the spectroscope. Is this all the spectra in the world? No, of course not. But it's a definite good start and it will get you comfortable with what you're looking for when you're using the spectroscope. From there, you can find free online resources. Once you know you know how to use the instrument, finding the actual spectra in references isn't that expensive. The hard part is putting in the payment of time and effort to get there and understand how the tool works. There are other books that are recommended by many gemologists on spectroscopy, but realistically, small book, this will get you most of the way of where you need to go as long as you have reference stones. Of course, it's ideal to have somebody who is competent with using the spectroscope nearby you to help you to make sure that, yes, this stone has the spectrum. Yes, you are seeing it now. Yes, it looks like this. But in lieu of that, get the book, get a couple of sample stones, and practice, practice, practice until you see. So what sample stones do you need to get comfortable with the spectroscope? The first one, in my opinion, should be almondine garnet. So we've talked about garnets a couple of times. The nice thing is, that inside of the two families of garnets, there are a whole bunch of spectra in this family over here, the pyrospite family. So that's pyro, almondine, and spessartine, or spessartite. Each of those three has a different spectrum, and they are wildly different, which is helpful for us, because it helps us to get an idea of how does the spectroscope work. And those three types of garnets, which can intergrow, so certain stones will actually have several of those different spectra in the same stone because the different minerals are intergrown together in the same crystal. Isomorphic replacement. But having those stones on hand, almondine, spessartite, and pyrope, will help you get comfortable using the spectroscope without breaking the bank. Remember, you don't need a top quality piece of these minerals to see the spectrum. You can have a really cheap, ugly one if you want. Of course, I prefer to keep beautiful stones on hand myself, so it's up to you. If you want high quality pieces of these, let me know. So almondine is one of the most distinctive spectra that you need to learn to see. Obviously, I like spessartite, and I think spessartite is a much more interesting stone to invest in, as well as make jewelry for, and that has a different distinctive spectrum. After the garnets, I would definitely suggest getting a few pieces of synthetic ruby, synthetic sapphire. These are very cost-effective ways to practice with the spectroscope. They have distinctive spectra, and they're not going to break the bank. The added benefit is that there is overlap between the synthetic ruby and sapphire spectra and natural ruby and sapphire spectra. Remember that a synthetic stone is a man-made stone that is the same in every way, chemically, crystallographically, with the natural stones that grow in the earth. There are some quirky little differences, but the major spectra is the same. And one more critical piece that I would definitely suggest having, maybe in a few of them, because the spectra can be different, they can vary, is zircon. Zircon is not to be confused with cubic zirconia. These are completely different in every way except for the sound of the name. Zircon, natural zircon, whether it's treated or untreated, has a very distinctive spectrum. Now, some of the younger type of zircons can actually have a wild spectrum called the jailhouse pattern, which has lots of dark lines. 
Many of the heated pieces will not have that spectrum and instead have a distinctive line in one particular place. So if you are looking to get hold of a spectroscope and a sample of stone so that you can become confident and competent with a spectroscope, then please contact me. Head over to gemshepherd.com where you can contact me directly. Otherwise, if you've got any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and tell all of your friends about me. Until next time, goodbye. bye, -bye.